old movie weirdo himself, Will McKinley, has asked thrice for the Cinema Shame director's cut of the Shame Down episodes. The following is a bonus mini episode from the 1972 Shame Down. It features the unedited conversation about Michael Ritchie's prime cut and includes Alan's anecdote about Michael Ritchie's quote unquote involvement with the Bad News Bears Go to Japan. Despite the episode's two plus hour length, I regretted cutting the story, and this is my penance. If you can't get enough cinema shame, and really, who can? The next season is coming soon. And just as a teaser, we'll be switching up the format a bit to turn out more frequent episodes. I'm also bringing Chris Myers and Alan Mott back and giving them their own co-captain's chairs. Just a reminder, but you can rent both Prime Cut and The Bad News Bears Go to Japan on DVD Netflix. Sign up for a new subscription right now at dvd.netflix.com. While I have your attention and I'm not desperately cutting juicy minutes to fit these massive episodes under two hours... It would really help the show out a lot if you could slide into your favorite podcast provider and leave us a quick five-star review. Tell a friend to give us a listen, subscribe to DVD Netflix, and share your little red envelopes on social media. Every little bit helps and keeps morale in the shame quarters high. And now, back to Prime Cut, Michael Ritchie, The Bad News Bears Go to Japan, Carl Reiner, and Fidel Castro. So for my, and that was a movie I just saw, I went with the, the aforementioned Prime Cut from Michael Ritchie because it was, I, I watched it because it's Michael Ritchie. I, I am trying to, you know, I, I, I'm actually afraid of finishing the Michael Ritchie filmography because then I run out of Michael Ritchie movies to watch. And we're getting down to the bottom now. This is one of the last ones. It felt like I needed to watch it because it's the year. So this is Prime Cut. Plot synopsis really briefly, because it's a brief plot synopsis. Lee Marvin plays a Chicago mob enforcer sent to Kansas to collect a debt from a meat packer mobster played by Gene Hackman. And uh, it's set up to be a pretty standard... Gene Hackman and his boys are waiting for them. Nick. Marianne, you eat guts. Yeah, I like them. Talk now, eat later. Nice to see you in the same old rat hole. Tell Marianne that I'm here. And not to get any fancy ideas about turning me or any of my boys into hamburger. You got it. Lee Marvin, Gene Hackman. <laughs> Together their murder in prime cut. Yeah, you're smart. You and Jake, you think you're big men, huh? Walk in anyway. You take down your pants and I'll take down mine. We'll see who's the biggest man. Why don't we just ask Cloud? They tell stories about you now. Good tough ones. Did you come here for Marianne, Nick, or me? Marianne. Marianne is freezing things at the ice house. Me and I'm already thought. What do you think of all this, Nick? I think it stinks. This is my country. Yeah. And I give it just what it wants. Dope and flesh. Something up the arm. Something to lick around the belly. You have a good time last night? Huh? Lee Marvin. Gene Hackman. Prime Cut. The gangster film that's a cut above. Plot synopsis really briefly, because it's a brief plot synopsis. Lee Marvin plays a Chicago mob enforcer sent to Kansas to collect a debt from a meatpacker mobster, played by Gene Hackman. And uh, it's set up to be a pretty standard uh, mobsters jockeying for supremacy uh, then Michael Ritchie does what he does best and makes yeah. it something else entirely. Uh, it's you, a little white slavery and cannibalism. <laughs> just, 
<laughs> no big deal, right? I mean, from from the get go, you've got uh, the female slavery, which it consists of uh, naked women uh, drugged and kept in cages. Uh, those women include Sissy Spacek and her first credited role, uh, and Angel Tompkins, who uh, 1972 Playboy edition, um, and the star of Little Cigars. Uh, yeah. Uh, which was just before the release of Prime Cut. She spends most of the movie naked. There's uh, some suggestions of homosexual relationships. Graphic cow slaughtering, sausage making, cannibalism. Uh, and then there's there's this under ugliness that, that runs throughout the movie. And then Michael Ritchie comes out of nowhere and there's this absolutely amazing gunfight in a dense field of sunflowers that feels like it was the best shootout Hitchcock never made. Um, a harvester combine chase through the field, which is very uh, north by northwest crop duster situation. It's, it's a weird mix of this pulp sensibility and exquisite filmmaking technique, and I don't know which wins in the end. But I'm intrigued by the whole thing. It clocks in at under like 85 minutes. There's hardly, you know, there's no character development whatsoever. Um, but that doesn't really matter. What we're watching is, is, is sort of a, a pure cinematic mob gangster movie, crime movie. And in an area of the country we don't we don't normally see this type of movie set in, and it's set in you know, Kansas, and among the farms, and the whole thing's largely outside. It's kept away from the city entirely, uh, except for uh, a couple hotel scenes. I mean, I I love Michael Ritchie, and I had kind of heard mixed things about this movie. So I hadn't watched it. I've had the Blu-ray. I think I think people's mileage varies based on sort of their willingness, sort of like to to accept its depravity. Like it is like for a long time, I think it was considered probably the darkest studio film of sort of that period, just in terms of the the subject matter and what it tried to get away with, and you know, sort of the, the the relatively like sort of the the tone isn't quite, you know, it's, it's more like a dark comedy than it is sort of like an outright sort of like, you know, gangster movie. Yeah. <laughs> and we're talking about the, the female slavery going on in the beginning yeah. and it's presented. Let's see. I mean, I, well, they're literally presented as farm animals. It's, they're presented as cattle in cages. Yeah. And you have Gene Hackman presiding over it as, as only Gene Hackman can, because in the hands of just about anyone else, it's just sick. Yeah. But you're watching Gene Hackman, who is a master of the precise line delivery needed so that it's not grotesque. I mean, it is, but he's turned it on its head a little bit so that this is a farce almost in the way that he's treating it. That is really happening. But it is still menacing. It's kind yeah. of hard to really pin down what's going on there because it is both at once. Yeah. And yeah. the the tone of the movie is rides that rail throughout its entirety. Well, to me, it's very Richie. Like, because Richie, like, I always like found that Michael Richie had the most interesting filmography because with a few exceptions here and there it can basically be it's he, he's making like one of three movies he's either making a sports movie uh a satire or a fantasy or both or, or both, both. <laughs> like he, he he's mixed them up here and yeah. there but those are his three primary sort of like thing like genres that he's working in and i feel i feel like like this is like one of the ones where it, it, it feels like the most like an outlier if you just hear the plot synopsis. But when you watch it, it actually feels a lot like something like The Candidate, like Smile, yeah. in terms of its tone. And it's sort of like, instead of, instead of like, instead of playing off, like, instead of like making it, sort instead of doing it like sort of like Don Siegel would have done it, he, he does it in a way that like presenting it like as if, 
as if he's making a funny documentary about these really terrible human beings. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not a documentary that it even bothers to dig deeper beyond their surface value. Like, yeah, yeah. these, I mean, even the Sissy Spacek character, she has, there's nothing else going on there. Yeah. She had she was an orphan, she was sold into slavery, she has a just a horror story of a life. And she's then sitting there at a fancy dinner with Lee Marvin in a green dress that is completely see through. Yeah. And the whole restaurant is staring at her, going, What is going on with this? And they're existing like nothing is happening. I mean that's the that's the way this movie operates is that it, it's giving you the, the this horror story and undermining everything with this lightness and I mean like you said that that is really how Richie went about a lot of his filmmaking in, in that there is a topic but it's not really about that yeah and our reason for enjoying the movie has as much to do with his ability to refuse to be pinned down yeah. I mean, you can say this is a, a like a crime genre movie, but that's not it. Yeah. But everything about it is is saying that that you know that's the genre we're operating in. Yeah. Um. The 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 best thing I read. It, it was one of those movies I immediately went out and tried to find the contemporary reviews because I wanted to know what people saw like saw this because I'm looking at this from someone who's seen most of Michael Ritchie's filmography. Yeah. And knows how he goes about his business. So it wasn't surprised when I read the synopsis. And I was like resistant to watch the movie. But I knew yeah. that there was something else going on. Where it's like people going like, oh, this is the, the new movie by the guy who gave us the candidate in Downhill Racer. <laughs> <laughs> so Ebert compared Prime Cut positively to a comic strip. He yeah. said that. Lee Marvin's character, the lone wolf enforcer, feels more like a superhero than a mobster. Um, likewise, the villains in the movie feature nicknames based on their idiosyncrasies, like Weenie, who carries around <laughs> the sausages in, in his pocket, some produced from the flesh of his vanquished foes. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, just a little bit of cannibalism. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a little, and it's not even really overt cannibalism you have to put the pieces together i mean they're not hard it's like the the two edge pieces that go together um but yeah uh i i really dug this movie i'm not surprised to say that i was into a michael ritchie movie um but it is one that i don't think you know michael ritchie is a, an underappreciated american director and this is perhaps an underappreciated Michael Ritchie movie. I, I, I think it's, be, I think one reason is because his sort of, his best stuff tends to get overshadowed by like the, like the more commercial work that he made later on, like the golden child yeah. and simple wish and the Island, which really don't, those are the films that like sort of, they, they fit in somewhere in his sort of like, you know, his categories, but except for the island, I, the island is the one where I just sort of don't get why he was directing it. But uh, yeah, but, that never made sense to me. I don't. But but I, I yeah, when he's at, when he's operating at his best, he I think he is one of the best one of the best filmmakers of all oh, his time. His string and, of seventies, uh, like my, my yeah, like Smile is one of my my yeah. all time favorite movies. I, that's his masterpiece. Well, you just look at how he opened his career, and I mean, I can't. I can't fault anything he did for about 10 years running. Like every, everything he did was yeah. just a, a banger of a, of an interesting movie and, and stuff that's aged really well uh, in terms of perspective and like the, the racial dynamics and the sexual politics and all these things that, that some insight he had to all of this. Um, and then you get to the eighties and, suddenly he's just taking movies to work yeah and he's still there's still a spark of, of and he's Michael still, and he's still, but he's still he's still occasionally getting one in like yeah i, I like digs town to me is a very michael ritchie movie it is yes uh like the the i can't the, the one with the really long title with holly hunter about the woman who hires the cheerleader who who, who wants to hire hires the hit woman to hit person to kill to kill the 
the cheerleader. That's a good one. Like, uh, like he, he still managed to do some Michael Ritchie stuff in between, you know, flopping with the Fantastics. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that movie. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely just, just watch Michael Ritchie. I think that's the message here is, is yeah. whatever it is. Just, just watch it. Have you ever, did, have you ever heard the, the story, uh, what's, uh, Carl Reiner told about, uh, about the uh, third Bad News Bears movie? I don't think so. Maybe. I don't know. Okay, so... Uh, so so basically, uh, like, uh, the Bad News Bears, which Michael Ritchie directed, was a huge hit. And, uh, and, uh, and so they made Bad News Bears and Breaking Training, and they were trying to think of a third uh, Bad News Bears movie. And uh, Carl Reiner ended up at a dinner party with Charles Bluthorn, who was the owner of, uh, of of Columbia, who who were making the uh, the the Bad News Bears movies. And he uh, and he, 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 he and Bluthorn said, like, I have the greatest idea for the Bad News Bears sequ- for, for the third Bad News Bears movie. Uh, and Reiner said, well, well, tell me, I'd love to hear it. It's like, nope. I cannot tell you until you agree to do the movie. <laughs> and, 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 and Reiner was like, I don't know. And, but Blue Order was like, no, I swear to you, once you hear this, you will be thanking me. This will be the biggest hit of the year and you will make so much money on this. And so, and so Reiner, but, but finally curiosity alone gets him like, okay, I'll work on like the third, you know, bad news bears movie. And so he gets in Blue Dorn's office, and it turns out that Bluto, Blue Dorn has made a deal with Fidel Castro. And Fidel Castro has agreed to three days of filming. <laughs> so he will be the, the star of the Bad News Bears Go to Cuba. <laughs> and, 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 of course, Reiner at this point is stuck because he's agreed to work on this. But then he finds out that someone else has also in the same position he is. And he talks to Michael Ritchie and Michael Ritchie was like, well, he said it was the best idea ever. So I had to find out what it was. <laughs> and of course, the, the, the punchline is, is that the bad news bears go to Cuba never got made because it turns out Fidel Castro was happy to take Charles Blue Door money, but had no intention of ever appearing mm-hmm. in the movie. And so that's how we got the Bad News Bears go to Japan with Tony Curtis, which Michael Ritchie and uh, and uh, Carl Reiner didn't really have much to do with. <laughs> when America introduced them to baseball, the Japanese adopted it as a way of life. That was before the Bad News Bears go to Japan. Now, the most successful kids in movie history leave America and set out to conquer the world. It's all right, guys. Take off your shoes. Can we take them to our room? Now, how do I know? Do I look Japanese? What do I do about the tennis shoes in my bag? Put them in your purse. What? Marvin, if I take off my shoes, I'm going to get an athlete's foot. Well, that'll be the only part of you that is an athlete. (laughs) And before they're finished, the greatest little team in the world will think it just went through World War Three. Go get him, gang! They demolished the great American pastime at home. Women in there, baby! Now watch what happens when they strike out in the land of the rising sun. Yes! Out! Gracias. And now they've started a worldwide epidemic of hilarity as they take on a new culture. It's very weird. Add Dutch territory. Get involved in high finance. Two and a half percent of profits. Yes, two and a half percent. Everybody gets two and a half percent of profits. It should be five. What? Five? What are you talking about? John Wayne gonna get five. Learn the facts of life. Do you have to get naked? Uh, well, not completely, no. That's good, because when all my babies ain't getting naked, no how. I ain't no fool. You're certainly not. Fall in love. And tackle Japan's national hero. Ah! Now, take it easy. Now, easy. Tony Curtis takes charge of America's wildest export. Ah! 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 
then the Bad News Bears go to Japan. You gotta get it now, son! No matter what you think you see, you'll find it's not enough. No matter what you think you know, you won't get thrown. Rise your spark above the kirk But no matter where you hide Or what you're more than you No matter how that film is shown With all the sounds the same All the strain with fire the same Reaching for the top. This is a place where we watch will never do. Well, it's okay to want all the hits, but once you step across that debt, no matter where you have the birds come on after you. Lordy, it's a shame down, but in time, take down on the wall. Wise.